Good evening. This is Peter Helen with Dave Wemhoff on the show Israel. And to review why this show is called Israel, I'm just going to I'm just going to review that and and then we're going to present the subject for tonight. The name Israel was is used today generally when people use the word they're referring to the, the nation of Israel in the Middle East. That wasn't the case before the establishment of Israel in 1948. Up till uh, 100 years or so ago, the church was understood as the true Israel. But with the publication of the Schofield Reference Bible, about 12 million copies, one of the, the most published Bible in the last century, you had a switch over to a different definition. And if we read his introduction to the New Testament, which most Baptist, most um, conservative, Bible-believing type churches, as they are referred to, held strongly to Schofield's notes. Now, if you read, as you listen to this part I'm going to read, you'll get an understanding, because this is what people in America ended up believing. So, intro introducing the four Gospels, he says, Therefore, in approaching the study of the Gospels, the mind should be freed, so far as possible, from mere theological concepts and presuppositions, especially is it necessary to exclude the notion, a legacy in Protestant thought, from post-apostolic and Roman Catholic theology, that the Church is the true Israel, and that the Old Testament foreview of the Kingdom is fulfilled in the Church. So Dr. Schofield, who never was a doctor, never got an honorary degree, never, never had any credentials at all, even slightly that he could call himself a doctor, yet everybody, even his enemies soon after, even ones that opposed him, deferred to him as a great famous doctor. He sang that for 1900 years, all the Christian denominations thought that the church was the true Israel. He said they were wrong, and this was a hangover from Roman Catholic theology. And of course, for Americans, oh, if it was Roman Catholic theology, then whew, we don't want to be, we don't want that. So they were so eager to follow Schofield and, and, and recover what the Bible really teaches, that there are two people of, peoples of God, and that the Jews who are naturally descended from Abraham still have a distinction, still have a special relationship with, with God that the Christians don't have, and that the Christians are the bride of Christ, but the Jews are the wife of Jehovah. Now that's all throughout his notes, and every church takes it a little bit different. Some churches take a lot of Schofield's notes, some, some take some, but the American churches have been seriously affected by the idea that the Jews have a special relationship with God. Um, I wrote a paper for um, Mike Jones, Culture Wars, indicating that Notre Dame, most of the theologians there, through Karl Barth and through uh, John Calvin, through some of their professors there, also buy into the idea that the Jews have a special relationship with, with God apart from Christ. Where all throughout the New Testament, it's very clear you cannot have a relationship with the Father of Jesus Christ, except through Jesus Christ. And what, what I'm thinking, and if we can fit it into the subject for tonight, is that the church is allowing this Judaizing influence that is affecting every, all of its, its, its thinking and its theology. And, and I would propose that the Jewish remnant represents, if it, it, it fits in, to the Enlightenment, that it's, it's, these are ideas, the Enlightenment, which this country participated in strongly, held views that were opposite to Christianity. And today we use the term Judeo-Christian, okay, like, like Judaism and Christianity can fit. But the Jews of today, the Jews in the Middle East, generally tend to be atheist or, or, or nominal, nominal uh, believers of, in, in a deity, similar to like, the founders of this country, like Thomas Paine and that. Um, now I'm just laying that out. Now how, somehow we're going to try to <laughs> we're going to try to work the real subject of tonight. 
because I'm speaking from a theological aspect, but, but the subject we're going to try to wrestle with is your, your understanding of the pro-life movement and trying to get a, a grasp of the, bigger, the big dimensions of it, you know, dimensions that a lot of people don't focus on, the bigger picture. No, I, I don't know if that was if you could say anything to what I said, or can you somehow? No, I no. I, what I want to do is you know the theological. Uh, you you have a theological view, uh, which you know I, I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to argue with. I'm not presenting a theological view. I'm I'm presenting my observations, like you correctly said, uh, <clears throat> on the pro-life movement and its and its significance. Um, but first, I want some caveats and, and some definitions. I think that's important. Um, First of all, you know, when we're talking about, we're, we're talking about different things. We're talking about a pro-life position and a pro-life movement. Pro-life position basically, as I understand it, says uh, all life is sacred. Uh, that means that you can't have abortion, uh, you can't have euthanasia, you know, you can't destroy embryonic stem cells and stuff like that. Um, what, what the emphasis on the pro-life position is, uh, is primarily though as being opposed to abortion. Uh, that's my understanding. That's that's the primary emphasis, but it includes these other things. Okay, the pro-life movement are the people who are involved in the various activities um, to advance the agenda uh, of of the pro-life movement, uh, and that agenda, you know, is um, fundamentally of two different views. One view is to end, you know, all abortions and I suppose all euthanasia and all embryonic stem cell research and so on and so forth, uh, all threats to life um, that, are, that are not natural. That, that's one position, which is a pretty tall order for any, any, any movement. And then the second portion or the second major objective of the pro-life movement as I see it is to gain legal uh, protection of the unborn uh, and legal protection then you know, of, of, of uh, embryos and such and such like that. Um, the movement is, is composed um, of very good people, and they're decent people, they're pious people, they're doing what they think is right. Nothing I'm saying tonight is meant to um, be a slight on them, because I think that they're, they're doing their best. My comments are primarily directed at the leadership of the pro-life movement. These are the men and the women in positions of leadership who lead this thing, who developed it, uh, who lead it and who continue to lead it into the future. I think, too, we have to define uh, some other term. I think, uh, particularly, I want to def define America because, uh, to me, America represents a society. So when I talk about America, I'm talking about a society. Um, it's a society that usually exists, or that primarily exists, I should say, that's a better phrase, primarily exists within geographical boundaries um, on the North American continent, um, and when we talk about the United States or the USA uh, or the US, we're talking about a political entity which consists of a number of institutions to include the government which um, exercises a certain amount of control and dominance over the people and the territory within those geographic boundaries. Okay, I, I think it's very important we get that straight. Um, you know, society is one thing, government political entity is something else. The comments that are going to be directed mostly at the society known as America, because there is a society known as America. It does exist. It's based on certain principles and certain um, organizational dynamics, um, necessarily direct how it functions and how it works and so on and so forth. So we're, we're doing this. We're doing this right now in the dead of winter. You know, uh, no no pun intended there. But we're doing this in, in the middle of winter. Um, you know, everybody's just come back from the right, right, right to life march in Washington D.C. They had a local march here, and they all walk around the the mall uh, in Washington D.C. and they say stop abortion and and um, you know throw out Roe versus Wade. Uh, and then here in town, what they do is you know they walk around the courthouse and have various different talks and whatever. Uh, and so they get you know the people out to participate in this. So you know the, the the question that always you know comes up when you when you take a look at the pro life movement is you're saying what's it what's it really about, and um, I, I suppose that's the first question. What's it really about? 
what is the essence of the pro-life position. And I think that the essence of the pro-life position is obscured, quite frankly, by the leadership uh, and has been for a very long time. And I think that the essence of the pro-life movement is necessarily a question. And this is not a theological question. This is a question the society, societies have had to deal with from the dawn of time. And that question is this, upon what philosophy or what religion or what set of principles do we base our laws that govern this society? Upon what principles is this society oriented? That's the question that, that the pro-life position poses to America. Because what you have is the pro-life position rising up in the mid, -19, mid to late 1960s, actually, that's when it started. But then it really kicked into hyperdrive in 1973 with the Roe versus Wade decision. The Roe versus Wade decision did not mandate abortion. Okay? It's not the state, not the government, not the USA saying you will have abortions. It was a statement, uh, a, a rule of law, if you will, a case, if you will, that said, in accordance with the Constitution of the United States, the fundamental law of, of, of the United States, and also a, a, fun, a law which reflects the fundamental beliefs and shapes the fundamental beliefs of the society known as America, in accordance with that document, in accordance with our beliefs um, as Americans, you cannot, as a governmental entity, pass any laws that restrict access to abortion Therefore, people can have abortions. What the pro-life position is, and has been, as I understand it, and what the pro-life movement has tried to do, as I understand it, is to reverse Roe versus Wade, or get rid of Roe versus Wade, or have it overruled, whatever, um, and thereby say that our law is going to be based on a principle that says all life is sacred. Now, a lot of people who are involved in the pro-life movement are, um, they call themselves Christians, okay? That's the reality of it. They say this is God's will, that this is the way it's going to be, and this is what God's will is. We have, we have to enforce this law. We have to bring about this law that does away with Roe versus Wade and protects life. The United States and the Americans say, well, you know, it's up to you. Basically, if you are against abortion, don't have one. You know, if you are for abortion, and some people think that abortion is perfectly moral and perfectly legal, then the United States government and America, the society, says, well, then by all means, you should, have, you should be able to do that. Because we're pluralistic, we want people from all different faiths and re, and to come in and, and live here and, and not be hindered in their beliefs. And so what, you, what you're dealing with is a fundamentally different view of society that the pro-life position presents and that America presents. But the leadership of the pro-life movement don't want to bring that to the fore. They don't, they don't want to bring that conflict um, into the open, as specifically and openly as I've said it. Now, rephrase that conflict again. Say again what the conflict is. The conflict is essentially upon what religion or what philosophy or what principles are you going to base the rules or laws governing this society? And is anybody, uh, do the, have the judges say? Have the judges, I mean, who, who says what, does anybody know what rules our culture? Is there an official declaration of what principles rule this country? Uh, an official declaration of what principles, well, no. Does anybody, well, I mean, obviously some principle does rule the country. Well, um, I think that what you have, uh, you have had over the course of the years a number of legal decisions uh, by the various courts, um, but what you uh, and what these courts have said, especially in, in 2003 with Lawrence versus Texas, um, is that you know you can't base your laws, as I understand that decision, you can't base your laws on um, you know traditional values of morality or traditional teachings of morality. So you have to base it on something else, and. Um, I think what you're asking and where you're going is what is the nature of America? What is America? What is the society? What's well, if, it based on? If, if, That's what you're asking. Right. If I, uh, a friend of mine, his son is, is dating this girl, and she's from Peru. No one, this is, you know, no one knows who this is. And 
and he's interested in her. You know, maybe we'll get married and all that. I said, well, find out what kind of church she went to in Peru. You know, and he gave me the website. You know, I looked on it, and I go, hold it here. I see some problems here. In other words, she has been going to this church for five or six years. This is what she believes. These are her principles. So in real life, you can, I can determine, well, that person's Mormon. Hold it here. This is what Mormons believe. Are you sure you want to marry that girl? She's Mormon. She, here's where she's coming from. You can locate, usually you can locate a person. How do we locate America? What is his, its belief system? I mean, we're not a church, but we're still, we're this entity. And you should be able to say, because a lot of people around the world make, have opinions about Americans. You know, well, here's what, you know, here's what I think about Americans, or here's what I think they stand for, or here's what they do. Well, they should be able to track it down to something concrete. What is it? Is it the Declaration of Independence that we hold to? Is it? Uh, well, um, you've been I, studying this. What yeah, do you think? I don't. I don't think America is based on on any um, religion, um, or in large measure, I don't necessarily think it's based on a on a coherent, fixed philosophy. But, but okay, what you're saying is that the people in the pro life movement have shied away from really tackling. You know, who are we as Americans? What is that? What is our? What do we? They have shied away from that. The leadership has pulled them away from that. The leadership. What the leadership has done is said. You know, if if we rally and we uh, present our 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 case to the public and to the government officials, you know, we can get the law changed. Um, that's really what the leadership has said. But if you change the law, if you do away with abortion then it's going to be, in my view, it's going to be a set of dominoes. Because how do you get rid of abortion without also getting rid of contraception? And getting rid of, I mean, um, uh, il making it illegal. How do you do that? Well, because there's two types of abortions. There's the chemical abortions. You know, people are taking the RU486 and pills like that. Um, and, and sometimes contraception works as an abortifacient. Um, and then, and, and then there's, there's the surgical abortions. But I've heard there's three types in, this, in a certain sense, that one-fourth of all, abort, of all um, misconce you know, con where a child is conceived and they ended up being aborted, one-fourth are natural. In other words, maybe they, the, the baby's conceived and then a month later, within a month, it doesn't, it doesn't go. In other words, providentially, it naturally didn't make it. Well, well, uh, uh, contraception. So, so there was a conception at a certain point. Right. It went maybe a week or two. But they prevent the implantation because of the contra contraception. Or just God. Process. In other words, nature, God. In other words, you 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 have your you have proper sex with your wife. You know, you do it Christian wise, and you and the conception takes place maybe for a week or two or three weeks, and it dies off. But you don't realize it. I mean, so. We have no we have no control over that, you know. So if God, if you have a miscarriage, that just happened naturally, and let's say a natural miscarriage. I mean, you're doing everything perfect, you know. You're being healthy, and you're eating right, and then your wife still has a miscarriage. Well, yeah, miscarriages happen, and but when you uh, when you outlaw, you know, but chemicals, you're saying when the, when man steps in and purposely tries to well, kill what, that. when you say you're going to outlaw. Uh, abortifacients and abortion, then you're going to have to take care of the, the chemical abortions, which cause people, you know, to, to lose conceived children who aren't implanted. So that has to go cut back into contraception. Yes. And and so how are you going to how are you going to enforce laws like that unless you do away with contraception? Now what you're starting to do is you're starting to do something which is very antithetical, you know, to the American founding. Um, ideas and, and principles. I need to get back to this on, on American principles. You asked me that earlier. Um, but, but now you're starting to, to reverse this process that's been ongoing for 250 years in America. And that is that the culture is created from outside of the civil authorities. Now you asked me earlier, what is the organizing principle or principles under which America is organized? I said that, that, it's, that, there's, that there's a lack of coherence. What I meant by that is what you're dealing with is a lot of terms and ideas which are flexible, which are capable of being reworked, capable of being reinterpreted anew in each generation. So what you, what you have are some basic 
practical principles on how American society is set up. And these practical principles for, and, or operative dynamics, for lack of another phrase, are, are ideas like um, the government needs to be limited, the church and the state need to be separate, um, the basis of the laws cannot be based on any religion. That's, that's First Amendment. If you do a plain reading of just the First Amendment, um, these are some of the principles that underlie or operational dynamics that underlie the society known as America and are reflected in, in the laws to large measure. Um, so what that means from generation to generation changes, and that, that I want to explain my comment about the incoherence. So what, what you have is you have this um, society which is, puts power outside of the civil authorities. It's cultural power, which is real power in a society outside the cultural authorities, uh, outside the civil authorities. Even Aristotle understood that the civil authorities have a responsibility to that whole society, which includes, which includes um, keeping the culture a, a certain way and, and protecting the culture and protecting the religion. The Catholic Church used to say that for a long time, too. When I say say that, I mean they used to teach it, their, their preachers used to teach it. It is still a Catholic doctrine, but not many people talk about it anymore. It is still a Catholic doctrine that the state has a responsibility to the true religion, but you know nobody talks about it now. They talk about religious liberty. In the Reformation, they, didn't, they, they said the same thing. That's why you had competing states. Right? They, they, they said the same thing the Calvinist... about the state defending culture and the state religion. Right. England, That's right. England, we're Anglican. Okay. That's right. Or, that, that has been the procedure of human history since it was first recorded. That has been the practice of human history since it was recorded. Right. But For Amer 5, American, years. America, uh, the idea of American jettisoned. The idea of America jettisoned that. And, and I go back to Tom Paine. I think Tom Paine was a very influential character in the formation of this society known as America and ultimately the development of the political entity known as the United States of America. And what he basically said is he said, everything good comes from outside the government. The government's a necessary evil. Well, we hear that over and over again now. Oh, yeah. You know, and so they, they talked about a limited government, which is just supposed to do certain things of a, you know, of, of a very minor nature. The reality is, though, is that the powerful people outside of the government can manipulate the culture. And they, they also have a lot of power over selecting who fills the positions of the magistrates. That's how it is set up. They have, they so, have an enormous amount of power. So if, if what you're saying is true, that the government isn't really where it's at, it's the people outside the government. In, in America and in the United it. States. So who's, whoever organizes themselves the best That's right. outside the civil government That's right. is going to win. So whatever tribe or nation, whatever group, if it's the Polish or if it's the Masons or if it's the Knights of Columbus, that's right. Or if it's Notre Dame University or any entity that that can organize itself, because an individual person that has tons of money probably can't individually control the government. He'd have to. He, he would think he'd have to at least be organized with he'd other people. He'd have to be organized. Ultimately, it's it's the wealthy with the power in a society like America, where there is no societal recognition of a state church. Okay. Um, or of any religion, okay? That's the First Amendment. But the right? wealthy don't just get up every morning and call all the other wealthy and say, okay, what are we going to do today? You know, how, you know, so I would think there'd have to be more of a concrete organization, I mean, than, than just the wealthy, because they kind of oftentimes compete with each other. They're not, they're not apt to, you know, move the government as a unit. I mean, so, so I, I'd be looking for something more concrete actually who's moving the government well well when I say wealthy I, I'm really talking about I think the people um, yeah who have, who have wealth who have money but I think what you're talking about primarily at the center of the wealth are the people who control the currency basically who control the money they work very close with the people in media and of course they work very close with with the intelligence community and the government they all they all work together and and they know each other they they, they cross talk to each other um, they may do it in conferences, I'm sure. They may do it, you know, picking up the phone and say, hey, Frank, Joe, how you doing? You know, stuff like that. They all know each other because they have common interests and they have a common worldview. 
and they're smart. They know how the system's set up. They ought to understand that a culture will affect um, the government, that, that a culture um, has a deep interplay with economics, and economics has a deep interplay with the culture, and you've got a philosophy that figures in there somehow too. If you have the right philosophy, you can create the right society that benefits, you know, certain people. Amatore Fanfani wrote about this. He was an Italian. He wrote his doctoral thesis in 1935 or so about this idea of the structure of societies and how um, um, you have to have some philosophy or some principle underlying it and that those philosophies or principles can orient societies uh, essentially um, towards one thing or another. The popes, you know, haven't read some of what the Catholic popes have written, have said the same thing. Pope Pius IX said the same thing. A society makes a determination whether it wants to serve God or wants to serve wealth. Well, not everybody shares in that wealth when they choose door number two. So um, that's what you're dealing with. Now, where I've always brought this up with you before, maybe on the TV sometimes, is that Thomas Paine wrote his, his famous uh, pamphlet, which I heard one out of five people in America had or read. Common Sense. Yeah. Common Sense, his pamphlet, yeah. Common Sense, in 1776 or 1775. And at the same time, John Wesley uh, was writing a pamphlet that had a couple hundred thousand, apparently, that didn't get here. But his successor, John Fletcher, in 1776 wrote, or 1777, I can't get the exact, you know, wrote a book called American Patriotism Further Confronted. So this was a 150-page book that went into detail highlighting the complete anti-Christian false principles upon which the revolution was being based and trying to warn Americans not to fall into the trap. And the result, especially of Wesley's pamphlet, which didn't get here, was block the blockade hit, so they ended up going to Britain. And a lot of people say that Wesley basically saved Britain this is what I've from, heard. from following in a path of revolution. This is what I've heard. But Fletcher's point was, and he, his book was called uh, American Patriotism Further Confronted from Scripture, Reason, and the Constitution. I think maybe he had one more, but three main principles. And he said, Scripture says you're wrong. Reason says you're wrong and the Constitution of Britain says you're wrong. And he not only said they were wrong, he said that they were demonically wrong. He said the principles are actually parallel to Satan's principles when he, when he got one-third of the angels to follow him. So this was well, serious stuff. That's pretty strong stuff. And, and, and when Paine wrote Common Sense, what, what he was saying in there is he said, we can't have any hereditary kings. So you have to, you have to understand that when Paine is, is saying hereditary kings, he's not just talking about you know, George II and George III. That can also be applied to Christ, you know, from a theological point of view, as I'm sure you can appreciate, and some people could appreciate. But he also said religion, specifically, he says religion is supposed to, and these are Wemhoff's words, religion is supposed to be kept in the closet. You're supposed to worship on your own. Okay, that's the buzzword for saying, keep it in the closet. You know, you got freedom to worship. You can sit there and worship all you want, you know, and, and, and go to your, your, you know, your mosque, your synagogue, or your church of choice whenever you want but it doesn't come out to inform the policies of the state or the policies of the government. And in any event, as Paine said, the real power in society is in the society. It's, it's the entrepreneur. It's, it's the civil society. And we hear this over and over again still today. So these principles live today. So if you want to go back to what, to what America is based on, it's, it's, it's sort of, I think to a large measure, you can argue from a theological point of view it's based on a rejection of Christ and it's based on a rejection of history and it's an elevation of man in the central place um, which ultimately boils down to rule by the powerful because because then the powerful can manipulate the concepts over time and um, I think that there is some support for that argument well uh, what um Bob Dylan wrote the famous, uh, had the famous song, you know, you must serve someone, okay? Yeah. But he, I mean, he had a moment where he was really trying to be a Christian in a lot of what he was doing, but, but that's a concept he got from Scripture. And, and Jesus said, you either serve God or you serve mammon. Right. Okay? That, Which is how, wealth. That's how, Jesus said it's either one or the other. He didn't say there's a third service. No. He said no. that you either are serving God or you serve mammon. Those are your choices. And America really had a choice. 
And what Wesley and John, his successor, John Fletcher, were saying, this revolution is taking you on the path, not of service to God, because Wesley said, you're trying to be, the freedom you're going after is freedom from God's laws. You're not wanting to submit to them. He said, that's what's really going on. And by rejecting Christ, there's only one other service available. That's, you put, that you're putting yourself at the service of mammon. And wealth, and, and that means wealth, and that means wealth in many things. And uh, you have to understand, America is, was, and probably always will be, a commercial society. And um, which 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 means what? I mean, well, can you can you break commercial down? Yeah, that, I think you can. That sounds so nice up here, but well, break it, it down to its its ugly parts. Well, well, what what we're talking about is commerce, right? So you're dealing with trade. Which How about mean, love of money? I mean, well, what, what would be a theological well, term? Replace okay, trying, the nice term. I'm trying to work this back. Okay, <laughs> commercial, commerce, trade. You know, good trade in goods and services. When you trade in goods and services. You need a medium of exchange everybody agrees on. With that medium of exchange everybody agrees on, it's called money. Okay? Money is right now um, paper money, it's fiat money, it's created by central banks. So there, it becomes the, the medium of exchange. So when you're talking about commercial, you're talking about a society that's oriented towards money, really, at the highest levels. And the rest of the people try to get along, and they, they're not really conscious of that or aware of that, perhaps. And I don't mean you know, to fault them, but, but they are also, too, kind of caught up in this thing. And so what you see over and over again, if you watch the TV, even today, because these principles have lasted 240 years, these dynamics have lasted 240 years, uh, since the founding of the United States or since the founding of the society known as America, what you see over and over again as you listen to the TV and you listen to people and watch things is, is it's about money. Saving money, making money, having money, having wealth, being somebody, being comfortable. And so the way that you get those things in a society like America is, you know, you have to kind of go along. You have to go along with that idea, with that understanding that um, Thomas Paine put out. Those yeah. principles, those organizational dynamics. Well, one way to find out where this, the rubber hits the road on this idea would be ask people, which, which you know, we're from the 60s here, um, some of the audience that are watching here from the 60s, as far as growing up, growing up there. And the big complaint, I've always said, of the 60s, generation when you got people from the 60s when they were all huddled up trying to figure out what's happening. The number one complaint that emerged all the time, the frustration, was that their parents never gave them any spiritual guidance. There was no, no, no direction as far as truth, no direction. It was all about money, you know. And that's how a lot of people have been raised, is that, the, that what's important is getting a good job, who you are is, you know, do you have a good job? Your job is very close to who you are. And are you saving? Are you investing? You know, are you a real productive part of the society? Everybody has to make a living. I, I, and I don't want anybody seeing this saying, you know, well, you know, we're against making a living. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against making a living. I'm sure you're not either. Everybody's got to make a living. Everybody's entitled to the fruits, fruits of their labors. Um, and that, that's not what, what I'm saying. I don't think that's what you're saying. It, the middle 1960s were an interesting time. Okay, that's when really the pro-life movement started to get going. And what you had in the mid-1960s, you still had the Cold War going on. And, and what you had is, you know, you had America as a society over here, and you had the Soviets as a society over there, and the world was kind of cut into two big camps. And so what you had with um, the people who, who started the pro-life movement, who were largely Catholic leaders, Catholic academics, you know, Catholic, Catholic prelates, to large measure they were Catholics. Sure. They, they started this movement at a time when they thought that America is the ideal. America is great, it's good in, in its principles, it is the ideal. Um, life is good. I mean, things were really good in America but in the But not 60s. necessarily some of the students. Not some of the students, A lot of the no. students were seriously doubting. They were. But you were also having the cultural mandarins, the cultural engines at the time, were starting to change the tune a little bit, okay? But um, they were starting to change the culture by some of the things that they were putting out. But that change in the culture was a perfectly in accordance with the operational dynamics of society known as America, with the organizational principles known as America. So you got, you got the pro-life movement starting 
you know, in the mid 1960s, and basically it was just a statement saying, you know, we need to we need to protect the unborn. Um, otherwise, you know, America's fine. Let's just get a law in there saying we're protecting the unborn. And so that is that is the same idea that the pro-life movement keeps alive to this day. Um, they, they basically are saying, you know, America is based on foundationally good principles. It's good in principle. It's a carryover from the Cold War, basically. And what you're saying, what you're having then, is you're having people saying, if we just change the abortion law, we get rid of Roe versus Wade, everything's going to be fine. You know, we'll just go back to the way we were. And what happens is you get a lot of very good and decent people in the pro-life movement who are very passionate about saving innocent life. Okay, and they're involved in this, and this passion regrettably gets used. Okay, it gets used by the political parties, by people who can who can make a name for themselves, being in the pro-life movement, or can be comfortable, you know, talking about pro-life stuff, and they've kind of figured out the system how it works, um, and a lot of the rank and file pro-lifers have not regrettably, and but they're decent people. They're just being um, misused. So, if you had the people in the pro-life movement and you could huddle them up and say, "Okay, let's let's call a different play here. Um, let's 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 think outside the box and see if we can uh, we can approach what we're up against in a more effective way." And basically, you'd be saying, "Let's dig down deeper. Okay, let's let's see who's really controlling us here, who's possibly controlling us, and let's control ourselves." Okay, I mean what? Would, would you say they should disband? I mean, should no, they regroup? No, or no, no? I, th I think what they need to the regroup. Ideal? I think they need to regroup is what they need to do. Um, they need to regroup. Um, all the people who are member of it, members of it really need to regroup. I think that, you know, the churches, and I'm, once again, I'm looking at this as a sociological phenomenon, in yeah. my observation, not theological. But what they need to do is basically regroup. And um, one of the things that they have to uh, reject is this underlying theme or principle or organizational dynamic in America of this unconnected individualism which is tied to this idea of freedom and um, this individualism has got to go you have to understand that the individual and the community work together so what I'm saying it has to happen is Roe versus Wade is a wake, was a wake up call? Well, it still is a wake up call for for every group, whether whether it's ethnic or religious, whatever it is. Um, ethnic and religious, I guess, are the two big ones. That, that's that's really it. Ethnic and religious. It's a wake up call for those two groups to huddle, to come to grips with the idea of community, of their community again, and to care for their own. I, I we've talked before, you know. Um, about the church, um, and what I think the church should do, they have a perfect example in their history. It's called the catacombs. You go to the catacombs. Because what the catacombs did is they did several things. Well, they protected people, sure, but what they also did is they built a culture. They built a community of the Christians. But what was the strength of the catacombs? These were people that were willing to go against what was the dominant theme then. Don't bring Christ out into the marketplace keep Christ to yourself. But see, they would go out and witness. The word martyr is the Greek word for witness. Right. And when they did witness, they were they were at risk of their life. They were ready to... So to, they were willing they were to willing. bring Christ That's right. wherever... Every place. Right. That's right. And, and, and by doing that, right. they put themselves... You know, they all they had to do was, hey, just keep it in the catacombs. Kinda. Right. Well, but, but what you did is you built a community. And, and that community is important for people to be emboldened to go out and witness and ultimately be martyred. But the community was founded on the idea that we're not afraid to mention Christ. Right. It's based on truth. But it was and based those on that truth were, those, those that wouldn't mention Christ might not have might not end up being part of that community. Because that was essential to be a member of that community. Was a willingness to stand for Christ. I mean in a, right. to a degree. I mean isn't, I mean, that's why they were in the catacombs. It was it was right. very hard because they were being persecuted. Well, that makes sense, right? And this gave them strength, and this gave them uh, unity, and this gave them the chance to look after your own. It's it's not wrong to look after your own or to care about your own first. Everybody has been in an aircraft or an airplane, a commercial airplane, and you go through the safety briefing. You know, uh, they tell you where the exits are, and the flotation cushion is under your seat. 
and they say if we lose uh, pressure, you know, the, ga the, the mask falls down. And they always tell you that when the mask falls down and you're losing pressure, you put your own mask on first so right. you can help people around you. That's the same concept I'm talking about here. The ethnicities and the religions need to pull in and say, we need to take care of our own first. You want to reduce abortion? That's how you do it. If you don't believe in abortion, well, pull your own together and, and, and reduce it that way. The, the, um, the U.S. state has, has said, you know, it, it's an individual choice, uh, but also, too, as I understand it, there are U.S. You know, um, policies out there that allow you to free exercise of your religion. So if that's part of your religion, to live in a community and care for your own according to certain concepts and precepts, I, then they shouldn't, then the U.S. state should not interfere with that because of the principles that the society adheres to, which is freedom of exercise. Is there any, any, any place in the world or in America where you see people doing this? Are we I, I don't, no. I mean, I, I still see a very strong individualistic bent uh, to when all the When was churches. the last time in history that people did do this? I mean, where do, how do we discover this? I mean, obviously it's been done before in the catacombs. Well, well, people have always gathered together in their nationalities and in their ethnicities, and that has been broken up in this country quite a bit. Yeah, people don't really have an ethnic connection. I mean, there's no real it's, German, it's a vague there's no German one. ethnicity. It's a vague one. People still kind of know where they came from in this country. They still kind of know if they're German or they're Norwegian or, or they're Spanish. They kind of still understand that Right. In, in an inchoate, in a very distant way. They still understand that. Um, and that's something that can be gained back. But, you know, what you're dealing with is you're dealing, again, with a society that values the individual. That is a principle in American society, always has been. Individualism, which is very highly regarded, and material success, which is very highly regarded. So who wants to go to these, you know, social catacombs that I'm talking about? I'm not talking about digging holes in the ground and living there. I'm talking about these, these social communities that you know, that people are tight, they, they live together. Who wants, who wants to go live in those communities and possibly lose the chance to go to Harvard and be somebody? I mean, who wants to do that? Right, because that's the path that's most... Uh... Well, that's the American way. It's individualism, it's the American dream. I'm going to get a lot of material things because I'm going to look out for me, and that's how I'm going to do it. And so everybody around you then becomes a competitor, or they become a client, or you know, they become an enemy, I suppose. Well, it, to go to the theological... Or an ally, I guess, you know. Can we, take, can we draw on the theological extreme where the, the ultimate evil in the scriptures is Judas betraying Christ, which in a sense he was betraying the other 11 too because they're all their lives were in danger. Yeah, he was destroying the community. He was destroying the community... And the, the, the specific reason he did it was for the 30 pieces of silver. Or he was trying to destroy the community. He hurt the community. Let's put it that way. And it used to be, if you read the old, the old theology books, all the way back to Christ, is they really were looking at your money ambition. And, it, and as soon as you were doing something more for money than Christ, I mean, you were, you were labeled like a Judas. I mean, hold it here. Where are you going? You're, you're not supposed to be doing things more for the money than more for Christ. And in fact, Jesus said, either you love one and hate the other or cling to one or despise the other. You can't serve both. So Christ required a strong allegiance to him and a renunciation of the one. And when people manifested this, you know, hey, I'll take those 30 pieces of silver and then I'll compromise Christ a little bit here. But, you know, it's worth it because I got the money. But, but see, I think those principles are in common sense. I think in, in Thomas, Thomas Paine's common I, Thomas Paine's common sense, I think lays those principles out, because he writes in there. He says, you know, Americans, maybe Scandinavians, English, and some other nationalities, but we all can work together. That doesn't matter because we're all working together, basically to get uh, material wealth, individual material wealth. And religions push off to the side as something that you worship, and government's supposed to protect, you know, that worship. But we're all out here to make something of ourselves, to realize the American dream, to make money, you know, to, to get materially wealthy. And Gordon S. Wood, uh, or, or to become famous, or, or to become wealthy, and what, it doesn't, you can Great be wealthy, in terms wealthy of mainly in money, but wealthy in something. Right, wealthy in something. And Gordon S. Wood of Brown University wrote the book several years back called The Radicalism of the American Revolution, and he said that the founders, many of the founders, felt that the revolution was a failure, because they were hoping to replace the British uh, um, 
this aristocracy, the British type of aristocracy with a merit-based aristocracy, and that they would find all these Cincinnatus, you know, these these people that were just concerned about the common good, apart from any self-interest, and he found out basically there wasn't any. If if you read the Federalist Papers, it's all about playing interests off and up, one interest off another. It's about a balance of interests, usually commercial interests. If you read those papers, all 85 of them, that's what they're talking about. Now, sometimes they mention religion uh, and religious groups and sects, but they're talking about basically a, an alliance between powerful interests. And so you can say, you know, going back to your earlier question, you can say another operating principle or organizational dynamic of America is power, is the ability to wield power effectively. Who's got the power rules? Because, but because what the revolution did, it, first of all, it stripped anybody of any ethnic connection, which was a British. That's connection. right. So they were no longer British. They're no longer British. They, in fact, they were Very ashamed of it. They cursed the king. They yeah. renounced. 1776, something called an American came into being. That's the reality of that year. Right. And, and it's to be noted that these people claimed to be Christian, most of them. They claimed to be Christian. They claimed to be. You know, a lot of the followers, maybe some of the leaders didn't, but they claimed to be Christian. And the teaching of Scripture, of course, is to honor and obey the king and pay your taxes. And it says it all throughout the Scripture. And before all things, pray for the king and those in authority. But basically what they did, they cursed the king. They cursed anything British. Benjamin Franklin's son was governor of New Jersey. They put the governor of New Jersey, Benjamin Franklin's son, in a dungeon for several years, okay? <laughs> because the son said, Dad, this isn't right. Yeah. Our duty, I have a duty. To, to the crown. I have a Christian duty to the, to the crown. They have right. not done something. And John Witherspoon, the, leading, the only cleric, the leading cleric, president of Princeton, and John Adams both came out and strongly said that King George was not a tyrant. So you go, hold it here, what's going on then? No, what you had was you had the British Parliament passing a lot of acts that the, the um, Americans didn't like or that the colonists didn't like. Right, but these are all the British people, the, all, the whole, all the British people represented by their representative in Parliament right. saying, hold it here, you guys. Well, the colon you, don't, you don't control us. Well, the colonists were arguing we weren't represented in Parliament. That's what the colonists were arguing. Do you feel you're represented? I mean, what's... What I was never represented in Parliament, I can tell you that. Well, I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm saying, that. does any American... Certain. I mean, this, what's this idea of being represented? <laughs> I mean, is anybody ever really represented? I mean, you can't tell your representative to do what you want all the time. But, but well, well, that's when you get into the discussion of form of governance. Democracy is a, is a republic, and that, that's that whole discussion. But the, the point is, is that Thomas Paine is a key, because John Adams said without Thomas Paine that the revolution wouldn't have occurred. It wouldn't have occurred. But however, soon after the revolution, uh, people started, uh, Thomas Paine, well, first thing, he goes over to France to try to, get, to try to get the same revolution going in France. That was his purpose. And we, Thomas Jefferson went over there to seed our revolution to over there. It didn't work going to Britain, because Wesley and those guys stopped okay. it. Right. But, and then Paine was tried in absentia in Britain and convicted of treason, I believe, or yes. sedition. Right. So, so he, but Thomas, he but Thomas Paine didn't give up the cause, and he writes another book, All right. Age of Reason. Age and of in reason. there, he point by point is trying to disprove Christianity. Right. And that was Abraham Lincoln's favorite author, Thomas Paine. Because yeah. Lincoln, according to everything I've read, also wrote a book, about a 40-page book, trying to disprove Christianity. And his people that were over him said, you're not going to go much right. if that gets published. So they, 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 they got rid of it. Right. Okay, I don't think that was a myth. But people have to look into that. But, but Lincoln took up the banner of his favorite, which was Thomas Paine. But the problem with Paine was when people in America found out that he was totally trying to destroy Christianity, which they didn't see in common sense. They hated him. I mean, about... What, eight to ten people showed up at his funeral? Americans despised Thomas Paine. But it, the damage had been done. They don't despise his project. They are the project. I, I think that's right. His document crystallized the society. I mean, you know, whatever went before kind of fed into it. But what you have now is this society which is based on this idea that people are motivated, you know, by self-interest and desire for material wealth and religion is relegated to an inferior uh, position to be protected and to be private. Government is supposed to be limited, um, which, as I think I mentioned earlier, is complete break even with Aristotle. 
with, with the ancients. And 5,100 years of recorded human history, and there's no state religion. The United States was the first secular state. It was the first society to renounce um, a state religion. Um, without the American Revolution, there would have been no French Revolution. But if you take a look at a lot of history books, um, you know, they just kind of go over the American Revolution and go right into the French Revolution. Right. But, but what I'm saying is the pro-life movement latched in the mid-1960s. Again, America was brought up, you know, as the ideal. A lot of the leaders of the pro-life movement um, were Catholics, and they had come to believe that America is good in principle. It's based on, on good principles. But if you cornered them... It's said, not the ideal. If you cornered them, what are these good principles? Obviously, they're conformity to God's they're law. They're going to say freedom. They're going to say it's freedom. Well, this is, this is why I said earlier it's an incoherence. When they're talking about freedom, what, what are they talking about freedom? Freedom, you know, Janet Joplin said freedom is uh, when you've got nothing left to lose. That is one definition of freedom. Um, but freedom from something or for something, you know, what are you talking about? I'm sure it does not jive with Christian freedom or theological freedom. I submit to you that the idea of freedom is one of these ideas which is redefined, and hence my comment earlier about the incoherence of these principles, but it's a, it's a, it is a, it is a idea which is redefined generation to generation to justify something else. You know, now it's being used to justify so-called gay marriage, you know. Uh, yeah, in the name of freedom. In the name of freedom, right. It's in the name of freedom. So if you're an American and you believe in freedom, I, I think that'd be for gay marriage. Well, that's what John Wesley, when they wrote a couple hundred thousand of his, uh, uh, pamphlets at the same time that Thomas Paine, 1776, which right. didn't get over here, basically. He, he, he said, what free, he was addressing the whole theme, freedom, and he said, freedom, it's freedom from God's law. That's yeah. what you guys are fighting for. How insane right. is this? Yeah. And, and basically, hold it here. What's our government? You can't pass a law if it's based on religion. You can't pass a law if it's, hold it here. Where are you getting that? You're getting that from the Bible? That's illegal. The, the Catholic leader, leaders of the 1960s um, uh, you know, the bishops, the priests, a uh, lot of priests, the academics, a lot of the wealthy and, and well-heeled and well-connected Catholics uh, really bought into America as the ideal. They bought into this idea of freedom, which is a floating definition. Um, but they forgot, they forgot their own history. When they went over, when the Catholic bishops went over to Vatican II, they were intent on making a mark on the council, an American mark on the council, and that was the, the Declaration of Religious Liberty. And they were talking about freedom, um, you know, throughout this whole process. And so what you had is you had, um, you know, people starting the pro-life movement thinking, well, you know, we just fixed this one thing, you know, we can, we can fix it, America's fine in principle. But actually, Roe versus Wade is part of the founding American principles of, or operational dynamics. And, and so is, is so-called gay marriage. It's part of that continuum. It, it follows out from there. Right. Roe versus Wade didn't come out, out of nowhere. No. It, it was simply, it's, another, it's an expression of these fundamental American principles, which, which, they, which, which they really hold to. Which is, which is the individual knows best. The individual makes the best decision, right? The individual is free to make their own decisions. Yeah, and basically he's free like Judas to betray the community and get the 30 pieces of silver. So in other words, it's, our society is set up to create Judases and, and to make people, the system tends to make people Judases. In other words, when you have a choice between the, the common good, your family, your tribe, or your, the good of the people, or making more money, you're lauded for, pay, for making, you know, why, I'm gonna leave town, I got a better job over here. Well, you're gonna leave your town like, and, and, you're, and that's considered a good. Right, right. The, the individ, there's a strong emphasis on individual achievement in America. There always has been. Um, and, and so all these family uh, traditional values, family uh, council groups, et cetera, et cetera, I don't, I, I, all they're talking about is the nuclear family. And the nuclear family is not enough. You need an extended family, whether that's a tribe or whether that's, that's an ethnicity. Uh, that's what Christian you need, or the Christian catacombs. church and the catacombs. You need that, but these guys never talk about that because that ultimately goes against the foundational principles of America. We're going to have to go into that the next show because uh, we're uh, out of time. I think we got one or two minutes left. Is that what we have? We got uh, another three and a half minutes. Okay, we got three and a half minutes. Oh, that's a lot of time. Okay, now if we were going to have another show. Where do you think we could uh, 
where can we take this? Uh, what, are, what are some things that could, where we could pursue from here? Well, I think that one of the things that we can talk about is um, the idea um, that some Catholic leaders, and I'm saying Catholic leaders because um, you know, the Catholics are, are, have a very um, notable organization that still seems to function to some degree. Uh, the Catholic leaders um, are starting to question America. Uh, one of them uh, was Michael Baxter, who um, is a professor or an adjunct faculty or visiting professor at one of the Catholic schools up in Chicago. He used to live here in South Bend, but he recently wrote an article for America Magazine in which um, he really started to question uh, the basis um, of the modern state, which the United States is, of the society known as America. He started to question John Courtney Murray, the Jesuit theologian, who really brought the Catholics, not just in this country, but around the globe, to the idea of America as good in principle, if not the ideal, of societal organization. He's questioning those ideas, and he's suggesting a new uh, paradigm for Catholics uh, which is the small community based on the so-called natural law, which there's many natural law definitions as there are people um, on the planet, I suppose. So we can talk about that, I suppose. Right, because that's an interesting development, yeah. and, and, and you've looked at it, you read an article, and uh, you wrote an article for Culture Wars, which I read the article, um, because you see some flaws in his position. Yeah, I do. Which makes it for interesting discussion. I do, yeah. And, um, and I'm going to continue to try to see how this theme of the show called Israel, where, the, ch where the, the church, Christian and Protestant, had been invaded by, the tip, by this Judaizing influence. And the church has kind of been immobilized. I mean, they've been compromised. I, I think they've been Americanized. Yeah, and I do think that this Judaizing fits in with the American concept. This American, we call it the Enlightenment, but the church has been compromised on its orthodox. I should say the Anglo-American Enlightenment. The Anglo-American Enlightenment was far different from the European Enlightenment. Okay. We have our own unique, right. unique take. I think so. Well, um, so for, we're going to try uh, to get more regular shows. The ideal before was a show once a week. And thank God we have public access. And we do have a studio down there at WNIT, but it's limited, and we're going to try to uh, produce our own shows here. And hopefully, Dave, uh, you'll be available to uh, pursue this, because I think it's at the interest of everybody in America, and especially those who are trying to figure out what's going on. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thanks for doing this. Okay. So until our next show, uh, may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.